electricity is used as a source of energy for many different things. For trains, for street lighting and advertising, and of course for doing work like this. Wherever we use electricity, we must have a suitable type of supply and a safe way of distributing it. This is part of the electrical installation in an engineering workshop. From here, electricity is distributed to all the machines, the lights and the socket outlets. Let's take a closer look at part of this installation, the supply to the machines. Now these require a type of supply known as three-phase. It's brought into the workshop by the four cables at the top here. The supply goes first to a main switch. This can cut off the electricity from all the machines, either for maintenance or in the event of an emergency. From here, the four-wire supply goes to a distribution board we can get a better idea of what happens here in this model. The four wires or conductors are usually colored black, red, yellow and blue. The black wire is called the neutral conductor. The other three line conductors. In the distribution board the neutral is connected to a solid copper bar called a bus bar. From this we tap off a neutral wire for the supply. Each line conductor is also connected to a bus bar, but in this case, the outgoing supply is protected by a fuse. Together with the other two lines, we get one circuit. By adding more fuses and neutral wires, we can divide the supply up into a number of circuits. Here's the neutral bus bar in the distribution board. Above are the fuses. In this case, they're cartridge fuses. This distribution board divides the supply into three circuits. These run across the ceiling for the whole length of the workshop. Each circuit is housed in trunking. The conductors inside are insulated rods of copper. At regular intervals, there are points for tapping off the supply to each machine. Before reaching the machine, the supply goes through a switch fuse. One fuse for each line conductor. Now a four-wire, three-phase supply offers a choice of more than one voltage. To measure the voltage here, we'll have to use an AC voltmeter. First, we'll measure the voltage between the red and yellow conductors. 415 volts. Between the red and blue conductors, it's also 415 volts. And the same goes for the voltage between the other two conductors. But if we measure the voltage between neutral and each line conductor, we get a different result. Between neutral and red, 240 volts. And between neutral and each of the other line conductors, the results are the same. Houses are usually supplied at 240 volts by taking their supply between a line conductor and neutral. In a house, this is the place where the supply terminates. It comes in through a service fuse. This is installed to reduce the risk of any fault in the consumer's installation affecting the supply. 
The service fuse is connected in the line conductor. The neutral is connected through a solid bar, and in this particular installation, it's connected to earth. From the service fuse, the supply is taken through a meter, which measures the amount of electrical energy that's used. It's measured in kilowatt hours. From the meter, the supply goes to a combined switch and distribution board. Here, the supply is divided up into several circuits, each protected by a suitable fuse. This one is rated at 5 amps and is suitable for a lighting circuit. Here, there are two 5 amp circuits. Next are two 15 amp power circuits. This is the fuse for the ring circuit, and this one is suitable for a cooker. Electrical energy is carried from one place to another by cable. This is an underwater cable, and it's being laid to carry electricity across the Cook Straits in New Zealand. On land, other cables are used to carry electricity underground. A cable is made up from a variety of materials, each chosen for their properties, in particular for their electrical properties. Let's look at a specially prepared section of a modern high voltage cable. This is one of the conductors. It's made from aluminium, a material through which an electric current will flow very easily. Wrapped around the conductor are several layers of paper soaked in a special oil. This insulates the conductor electrically from the others in the cable. If we compare the cross-section of this high-voltage cable with a low-voltage one, you'll see that the thickness of the insulation is different. Can you think why? The most common way of carrying electricity from place to place is by overhead conductors. These are also made of aluminium, but here, to insulate them from each other, we rely on the air between them. Just how good an insulator is air? In this laboratory, we're going to apply a very high voltage between these two conductors, set about 30 centimeters apart. We're measuring the voltage in kilovolts. 50 kilovolts, and so far, the air still behaves as an insulator. Now, the air's become a conductor. The voltage, about 180 kilovolts. So, air only insulates under a certain set of conditions. Let's repeat the experiment, but this time, we'll put a rectangular strip of perspex in the gap. Now watch the surface of the perspex. That was where the air first became conducting, and it happened at 150 kilovolts, lower than before. Because of this, high-voltage insulators, like the one we're making here, are usually shaped in a special way. The shape is designed to increase the distance over the surface of the insulator from one end to the other. This reduces the risk of air in contact with the insulator from becoming conducting. On overhead transmission lines, a whole chain of specially shaped insulators are joined together, giving a zigzag surface path. Now, these two coils are electrical conductors. The one on the left is made of copper, and the one on the right, manganin. We've connected the two coils in a series circuit so that we can pass the same current through both. 
Let's see what happens when we switch on. The current is just over 20 amps. Now, copper is a good conductor of electricity. When a current passes through, the copper remains cool. But the manganin gets hot. That's because the material resists the flow of current. The same thing happens in this type of electric light bulb. Inside is a coiled filament made of tungsten. When a current is passed through it, the tungsten offers so much resistance that the coil glows white hot. And every time you use a toaster, you rely on a metal conductor getting hot as a result of the resistance it offers. An electric iron is also heated in a similar way. Here, the heating coil is contained inside a metal tube cast into the base plate. The coil is made from a very high resistance material. To insulate the coil from the metal casing, a fine white powder known as magnesium oxide is used. This is also resistant to heat. We use magnesium oxide as an insulator in these cables. The oxide, or mineral as it's generally called, is compressed around solid conductors which are enclosed in a metal tube. This type of cable is known as mineral insulated cable. When the cable is bent, the mineral continues to keep the conductors apart. This type of cable also provides its own mechanical protection. In any electrical installation, cables will need to be terminated. Before making a termination, the ends of a cable must be suitably prepared. Here, we're preparing a mineral insulated cable. First, the metal casing must be stripped back. For this, we use a special tool. It's rather like opening a tin can. Enough casing is removed to provide sufficient length of conductor to make the termination. Any loose powder is tapped away and the conductors are cleaned. Now if left exposed, magnesium oxide will absorb moisture from the air. This would cause the insulation to break down. So to prevent this from happening, the end of the cable must be sealed. Using a special tool, a brass pot is first crimped onto the metal casing of the cable. The pot is next filled with a suitable sealing compound. Then a fibre disc is fitted over the conductors. The whole assembly is finally compressed to form an airtight seal. After that, insulating sleeves are slipped over the conductors.
All that remains is to make the termination. Now, regulations require that the termination of a cable must be both electrically and mechanically sound and carried out in such a way that there's no appreciable strain on the conductor. In this piece of equipment, the termination is made simply by clamping. Other cables are terminated in other ways. Here, we're going to terminate an already prepared conductor by soldering a lug onto it. After fluxing, the lug is heated to a temperature sufficient to melt the solder. That looks about right. By soldering the lug onto the conductor, the termination is both mechanically and electrically sound. A lug is also used as a termination on the conductors of heavy-duty cables, like this one. But instead of using solder, we're going to attach this lug by a mechanical method. This type of joint is known as a compression joint. Now, if the contact between the end of a conductor and the terminal isn't tight, additional resistance will be introduced at the termination. This will cause overheating. Even when normal current flows in a conductor, heat is developed. Consequently, there's expansion and contraction. Any strain on a termination could result in a loose connection, overheating and possible failure. When it comes to terminating a multi-strand cable like this one, it's important to have some method of holding all the strands firmly and safely together. Here's one type of termination that's sometimes used. It's called a Ross Courtney washer. Again, it must be made both electrically and mechanically sound. A 13-amp plug top provides one of the most common methods of terminating a multi-stranded conductor. Here, it's very important to ensure that the strands are twisted tightly together. It's also important to ensure that the nut is screwed down tightly. And, of course, the conductors must be connected to the right terminals. The earth is coloured green and yellow, the neutral blue, and the live brown. 